long ago. Yeah. I'm still active and doing things. Cool. But uh, hopefully get back in the cave. Awesome. Once caver, always caver. So glad to have you. Hi, I'm Kate. Uh, I'm from Colorado. I'm visiting the grotto. Um, I'll be moving here in a couple of months. So I wanted to come and say hey and uh, join, join the grotto soon, probably. Um, I went caving um, at Fulford Cave in Colorado, which is kind of a, a, it's a little bit trash, but that's kind of one of the ones that, you know, becomes open first um, after the bats come out of torpor. Um, so I did that, that was fun. And then some wetsuit caving in, in a cave called Spring Cave as well. Cool. Yep. Spring Cave, I guess, wetsuit. Yes. I guess that's appropriate. <laughs> so cool. Glad to have you with you. When are you moving here full time then? Probably at the beginning of August. Awesome. Yep. Well, we do have capers at the first week of August. I know. I saw that. So, so if you're here then, that's awesome. It's a whole weekend of caving. So, and you get to meet a lot of people. So, awesome. Well, glad to have you with us. Yep. Hola. Okay. Hey. No caving. No caving. No caving lately. Okay. Howling. Who's behind that mask? Uh, hi. No, okay. <laughs> Hey, Kyle Hoyt, uh, done nothing exciting lately, been pretty busy with work, a little bit of camping, but not much. That's about it. Yeah. Work, work, all the fun stuff, huh? Hello, hey. Ron, Ron Adams, and got to do some pretty good caving this spring. Uh, went to uh, do our annual ridge walk and tag early March, and we ridge walked for four days in an area where uh, you really don't hear any vehicles, um, maybe occasionally, and it's a long ways to a gas station. So spent four days pretty much off the grid, and uh, we were looking for caves in areas where all the known caves were located before they had GPS, and so they were, well, they were mislocated. <laughs> and uh, we were trying to find leads, and uh, we found a few holes uh, and then we made another trip in April uh, for three days and uh, we pulled some rocks out of one and it qualifies as a cave. It's a 90 foot deep, um, it was about a 70 foot drop and there was another little thing went down. So the total depth of the cave was 90 feet. Uh, haven't named that cave yet. And uh, we found another cave that had two entrances that was about about 120 feet long. And um, so it was a pretty successful ridge walk. We added two caves to the Alabama Cave Survey and we verified a bunch of locations. So it was a great time. I try to go every year, so. Cool. Awesome. Well, there's a lot of people out there you see around, it's not in the area you're at, but. No. No. Is Tennessee we, cavers moving around a lot, doing stuff? Um, there's been a lot of LIDAR exploration in Tennessee. Uh -huh. uh, they're, they're using the LIDAR, um, I don't know if you call it topos or whatever, to find new caves. And they've added a lot of caves. Wow. So, yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Thanks, Rock. Hi. Um, I'm Scott Fetcher. Um, pretty new to caving. Um, I'm a hiker and a backpacker first. Um, been a while since I've been in a cave. It's probably been a couple of years. I did Buckner a couple of years ago and another cave I don't remember the name of. Done Patton a handful of times, but uh, pretty new to this, so I don't really know much. I have much gear, so I'm just here yeah. to learn. Awesome. Yeah, every backpacker does Patton a few times. Yeah. <laughs> so cool. So, uh, yep. Uh, just check on the Facebook page. We'll put events for trips we don't have a lot on there right now but we'll be at we add stuff all the time so thanks hey, god to meet you hey look who's rolling in here yeah i'm denny came in lately uh flint sullivan's good weekends ago. sullivan's okay yeah. and we were there for a while and then we did uh i think there was another trip this month Am I missing something? all wise man it was last month let's go to tag danny no, I didn't go to tag. I didn't make that true. We have it to. Okay. Like, Tony Akers, by the way. Yes, Tony Akers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. 
Hey, okay. What you? What about you, Greg? Greg what you been up to? Uh, yeah, I went uh, caving with Ron and Danny down to Tag for three or four days. Uh -huh. and dug some pits and and then I also did some a dig uh, with Tony and Aida and a number of other Rand and Marion mm -hmm. and uh, um, Paul Weisman gave trying to get into paint lane, but I haven't really been doing a whole lot. But yeah, once a month maybe if I'm lucky. What? So which one's Paul Wiseman? It's uh, maybe a hundred feet deep, and it kind of sits over the hydrological connection between uh, the Wild West and in Bankley and the springs that they are ah. connected to. So, so what's it closest to? Wild West? Yeah, or uh, actually the downstream uh, McLean. In, in the Bankley. stuff that we haven't found yet. It, no, it, it just sunk. So yeah, so the stuff in between McLean and the, and the spring you're talking about? Right. Okay. Yeah, it's like five miles. Of the yeah. Stakes, very mine, and so I've, we've been working cool. on a lot of holes that are on yeah, that line right. trying to get in. So, cool. someday. Yep. Just keep digging, huh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Joe. Joe Kinder. Um, nice to be here. Thanks for having me. Um, trying to think of what I've been doing. Uh, Bazooka Joe. Yeah, I went to, uh, let's see. I went to the Tag Ridge Walk with Ron and Danny and Doug, and that was, that was great. Hiked our asses off. And um, so that was fun. I took my wife and kids and my sister and brother-in-law and one of my sister's kids to Sullivan. And I just beat them down. It felt so good. <laughs> awesome. I like, didn't really understand what we do. Yeah. And they kept texting me all the way up until like Friday. I was sore. <laughs> and, uh, awesome. Yeah, it was really good. So, and I went to Balcony Sinks. It's a new SCCI preserve. Uh -huh. And um, I'd recommend everybody seeing that cave if you can. It's been closed for, I don't know, forever. And so, I think a lot of people snuck there to see it, but, um, you know, a bunch of people pitched in to purchase the property and, and I purchased a piece and, and so I figured what the hell, go uh -huh. check it out. So, so yeah, thanks for having me. It's good What's the balcony sinks like? What kind of cave? Uh, it's like 120 foot deep, uh, never sink looking okay. pit with a big waterfall that comes in. Oh, wow. And then, um, I know there's a couple thousand feet of horizontal, uh, I think low and wet kind of stream stuff. And then um, uh, Elliot Stahl just recently did a bolt climb up into old paleo dry, uh, you know, part for a, a couple thousand more feet. Oh, so, wow. Cool. So, yeah, it's pretty, uh, it's a pretty epic little cave. Hmm. Yeah. Awesome. So it's got the big entrance and you drop into it, huh? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Hey, hey how's hey. it going? I'm Zach Snyder. Uh, haven't done a whole lot of caving recently. In the fall, went on a couple trips, um, just local pits. We uh, had some friends over from Chicago and took them to uh, Freeman's and Kearns and Glory all in one day. It was kind of nice. So oh, yeah. That's, a, that's a good day. day. Yeah. And then I took my kids to Sullivan's. And actually, I'm going to take my kids to uh, Wayne's Cave for a couple weeks. So oh, yeah. Had a good awesome. time. Good, good dad. Yeah. That's a good day. They're, uh, they're seven and eight. So oh, yeah. We won't go too far. <laughs> <laughs> Get through the crawl at least. Uh, a little bit of it. Have yeah. all your time. Yeah. <laughs> They'll never go again. <laughs> 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 All right. Wow. It sounds like you've been pretty busy, though, actually. Well, I mean, that's over a few months. I haven't done anything. Yeah. 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 yeah we're all kind of slowed down, I think. <laughs> so, yeah. cool. You, Denny Cavan, you want to share with us? Not really that much, except what Greg said. Yep. Yeah. You went down tag with them? Not tag. I didn't have that fun. Oh, no, you did the Binkley, yeah. Binkley digging, huh? Was it the Binkley? No. Yeah. Paul Wiseman. Okay. Okay. <laughs> cool. Hey, David. <laughs> oh, name? And yes, Jake Price. Who we have here? This is, uh, okay. I don't know. Rich. <laughs> yeah, I got everybody here. Yeah. <laughs> Ignore him. I, I went to uh, Donahue Dog Hill a couple weekends oh, cool. ago. Um, 
Classic, did the Donahue through trip, mm-hmm. the New Caver, and uh, Austin, um, Key from the Grotto. Uh, I mean, it's been a year since we've had a meeting. I've talked to you in a meeting since then. I've done Wayne. Uh, cool. Yeah, RPI passage there. Uh, Fredericksburg Cave. Um, yeah, yeah, most recent's Donahue. Uh, went to Patton Cave in Hoosier National not too long ago and kind of explored a little bit in the upper section. So, been doing some caving a little bit here and there. So, yeah, glad to be back. Yeah. Yeah. So, what, that's one question I have. We need a. What, so they closed down all the caves in the Hoosier National Forest all winter, except for Patton. Why does Patton get an exception? It's too far out for the Jim forces. Well, there's a lot of them in Hoosier National. Right now. <laughs> I don't know. I, think there's a, I don't know. It just kind of bugs me. I think it's maybe because it's so accessible by boat and stuff. Like, and the, the too. Yeah, the forest order doesn't Just exclude no that. Um, I, there's a lot of caves that don't have bats in them, you know, that they close down. Yeah, it would it would be, but it just seems like, I don't know why they, they give that a pass, why you think they're just blanket, you know, all the caves. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So we, we need glory hole open all year round. That's what we need. <laughs> all right. Name and Denny Caven. Hey, I'm Sam Brewer. Uh, first grotto meeting. Uh, awesome. Welcome. Yeah. New, new this year. Um, done a few. Austin McKee, like you said, got me into it. Uh, Jake and I went and did, we did Sullivan. You forgot. Yeah. You forgot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> where'd, you, where'd you go in Sullivan? Corey room. Okay. Uh, Lots of Ooh. Yeah. Oh, so you did the bathtubs then? No. Okay. So, so you we went, went to the spiral room? Yeah, we went to where the bathtubs are, like the yes. pathway to Colossus, okay. so, yeah. which I think is, is that spiral room? No, the spiral room's the other way. But okay. that's on the way to Colossus. It's, it's like the mountain room. room. It's in the mountain, room. mountain room is in the middle, yeah. We, we were like right to where you could go see the bathtubs. Okay. You two Colossus. So you climbed out of the foyer room down the down into the water out of the foyer room. Yeah, yeah through a lot That's of a fun, fun part right there. Yeah. yeah, that's a fun part. Yeah, yeah it was fun. long trip. It was so, like six hours. Right? Wow. All right, cool. Well, uh, somebody just had a trip to Colossus not too long ago, and I'm sure we'll be. It was Carl and Chris. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of people have trips in different parts of Sullivan, so keep an eye on Facebook to see stuff. So, oh, sorry to interrupt you there. So, uh, what else is it? Uh, no, I got a camping trip lined up at Lake Monroe to go, uh, you know, continue piling on Patton. And uh, <laughs> I went down last weekend to French Lake and camped. And, oh, did, were you down there? Uh, yep. Yeah. How'd I miss you? He was there. Uh, yeah, I was around. I don't know. Well, there were a lot of people spread out there in the campground. Kind of hammock next to the fire spinners for. Uh, oh, okay. So, yeah, yeah. so what would you do there, there that weekend? Man, I can't name the caves. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> into like four of them. They were wet and crawly, right? right? Yeah, they <laughs> some up on, uh, on Sunday and then, you know, back. I uh, glamped and got a steak burger afterwards instead of making a hot dog. Oh, yeah. But, yeah. You got to eat good afterwards. So. Time. Cool. cool. Awesome. Did you go to Dylan? Did you see it with all the bear wallows in it? Uh, I don't think they're real. Oh, they're real. They're real? Yeah. This is like, yeah, 10 or 12 of them on the ledge there. Yeah. Yeah, they're real. There's a lot of things you'll see around in the end that have them. And especially down there in the Houston National. They're not. They've been there for 100 years. Nothing fresh. Yeah. Cool. Rich? Yeah, I got a report. I was, uh, last weekend, I took uh, uh, nine other hearty souls to uh, do the Upper Twin Bronson Donaldson trip. And uh, we got through the Upper Twin through to uh, the bottom, the upper, Lower Twin. Boy, that water was high. Um, that's yeah, 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 it was a lot of swimming, but lots of fish. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of blind fish everywhere. Um, almost as many crayfish. One bat, unfortunately. But uh, we had an we had a 
somebody on our trip had a uh, had a medical emergency, so we had to uh, bail out after the after the first set because everybody was kind of cold and and everything. But because uh, it's a tough trip, I mean, I keep forgetting how if you don't have the right gear on, it's pretty miserable. But I always have the right gear, so I don't know for sure. But there were a couple people that didn't have the right gear, so. But it was a fabulous trip. It always is it's beautiful in there. Really cool. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, that's awesome. every year I do that. Cool. So, uh, the only thing we got on the calendar this month at the end of the month is Beetle Fest. You guys are new. If you're free on Memorial Day weekend, Louisville Grotto uh, does that. Uh, it's down just south of Louisville, about 45 minutes towards Mammoth Cave, and they have a campground there. And you go camp the weekend with a bunch of cavers and uh, go, there's cave trips all weekend. You sign up for them and uh, you have a chance to go in Rockwell Cave, which is part of Mammoth Cave, and, and uh, a lot of cool caves down there. So um, if you're open, uh, in bed too, that's, I don't know if you're still in town, um, that's, uh, that's a really great, great time to go down there. You can go to smilofest.com and uh, find the registration there. There's always a bunch of Indiana cavers that are down there, so it's a lot of fun. I mean, Kentucky and Louisville Browns, the great Browns are a lot of fun too. So, um, we don't have anything on the calendar besides that for this month, but keep your eye on Facebook. If you're not part of the group, make sure you join Facebook and check that because we'll be posting. I'm sure there'll be stuff that'll pop up this month. We'll be posting trips that pop up. Uh, we had a whole bunch of stuff go this month. Uh, with Rich two weekends ago, and then we had 40 people down at uh, um, French Lake uh, last weekend. And uh, so, uh, Hoosier National uh, Forest open day for caving. So, they closed the caves from September 1st to uh, uh, April 30th. So, on May 1st, we were down there, and May 1st and 2nd, and we camped out down there near French Lake. A really cool campground in teepees, camped in teepees, and uh, uh, and we just hit all the Hoosier National Forest caves on Saturday. Um, Paul Uglum and uh, is Paul on here? Yeah, yeah, someplace. Paul, hey Paul, thanks so much, Paul. Um, ripped up um, Fuzzy Hole and Hoosier National uh, Forest Swallow Hole, and um, for people repelling, and then uh, um, Scott Davis rigged up Glory Hole. And then we could swap people around from cave to cave so we didn't have a lot of people in one place. Um, and uh, the vertical cavers swift swapped around between those three caves and it worked out really well. Um, Paul got to uh, take the um, rock is rock. Uh, on there. Uh, yeah. Oh, Robert's a great uh, guy. Landowner yeah. of Hoosier uh, National Forest Swallow Fall um, is the new owner. Um, Paul took him on his first repel into his own cave, his first repel into a cave, period. He's been practicing for a while, and, um, and it was his own cave, so he was just ecstatic. It was, it was awesome that uh, Paul could do that, so that was really cool. Is that and, Rob and Debbie? Rob and Debbie. Yeah, he, they're on. Thanks so much for letting us uh, with your cave. That was, I mean, that really made the weekend. It really helped to have, have that available. We're excited. Uh, to, to meet you guys. Thanks so much, Paul, for doing that. And uh, glad you got in your cave and, uh, and hope you enjoyed it. So this is, uh, uh, so then uh, we also had horizontal trips going that day. Uh, Scott Frosch, which um, is not here tonight. Is he on there? No. No? Maybe. So Scott uh, really put a lot of the, the planning into the weekend. He went down the week before and flagged a bunch of routes to caves. And it was, uh, um, he had a whole, he had probably 20, 22 caves on the list there that we went around to. He had trips on, we had four or five people led trips on uh, Saturday and Sunday, horizontal trips. And there were 40 people there. That was the maximum for the campground. Uh, most of them were, from, a lot of them were from Ohio. Um, yeah, when is Because we did it with uh, uh, Central Ohio Grotto in our grotto. This is the fifth year we've done it together. We swap back and forth. They host us, we host them. 
and uh, it's always fun to be with them and uh, meet them. So that it was an awesome weekend. So we're kind of uh, we'll probably be a couple weeks before we start getting stuff on Facebook with events on there for some more caving. So just keep your eye on there. We'll have some trips coming up. So uh, I think that's that's about all I've done. So. Um, yeah, Treasury report. We're doing really well. We don't spend much money on the COVID, so haven't been haven't been out to spend money. But yeah, we got about two thousand and four hundred dollars in our in our bank, and uh, um, we have a deposit at, uh, at, uh, down at Crawford County for our capers, and uh, that's going to be a great great event too. We got the uh, um, ice cream coming in to. Uh, Cook us some whole pork and other wonderful things. So that'll be awesome. So I think we got, uh, we're just going to go ahead, wrap it up so we have plenty of time for uh, uh, Tony's uh, uh, program here. Um, so it's going to be good. So uh, we're just going to take a break, mingle around for a while while he gets set up, and then we'll, we'll get going on the program. Good job. I got a question about Gory Hole. There's still a rope hanging down from the dome in the back? Uh, short answer is yes. You're talking about the uh, rope in the second dome? Yeah. Yes. Uh, we just uh, put a new one in maybe five years ago. Bill Boss, we pulled the old one down and uh, re rigged it. A long time ago, that was a quarter inch gold line. Well, it's uh, a better rope now. It's a sheath rope. Yeah. Probably PMI. There have been a number of different ropes there over the years. Sure. Okay. Hoosier National Forest swallow hole was a bit wet. It's a waterfall going down, which made it Fun repels, a little over 40 feet, but you're in the water. Yeah. Is Parker's open? Yeah, that's cool. Parker's open, yes. Parker's Pit's open? Yep. It's got a new owner. Does anybody put a new fence around it? We have all the fences around it. Does anybody do it back to the far reaches? No, no. Uh, but I just got a report it's open and there's a new owner. Great. You gave her a tolerant. I'll let you let know you're there. It's fine. Hold on a second. I got to move this thing. You're all talking. Um, we got. Yeah, we're actually. Can't have anything. It's a member. It's good. We got these. You want one of these? Do you like to do these? Or we have. Uh, I'm going to stick right in with the beef that I'm sticking up over here. So, Scott, do you have any questions? Scott, do you have any I don't know if these are windows. Yeah, I'll try it. Oh, sure. Here, have another one just in case. Okay. Okay. Yeah. No. He needs a lot of hard rock too. So. Yeah, come on. I
Dallas area. Dallas area. You ever see Gary Napper? Yeah, occasionally, sure. He lives in Austin. But I get down there more often than he gets up here. Yeah, I see him. He's doing all right. Yeah, he's fine. You should come down sometime. Come visit. Hello. My dear wife wrote to me a week ago, and I won't be going anywhere for a while, but we'll come down. We have a van camping. Okay. I'll take you to uh, bring a wetsuit, or we'll rent one for you, and I'll take you to the longest cave in Texas. <laughs> Swimming. Zero gravity. Well, at least it's level. Yeah, it's fun. If you swim in a thousand feet, the biggest room in the cave, uh, you can climb up into it. Yeah. What, fun. What is, what is the cave behind you? That picture. Wautla. Sistema Wautla. Yeah. In Mexico, that's the that's the gigantic room. Uh -huh. it's half again the size of a dome stadium. Uh -huh. And it's got a thousand meters of rock above it to the surface. A long trip to get there. Are people still caving in Mexico? Is it safe down there? Yeah, there was a big expedition to uh, a cave just south of Watla named Sistema Cheve, and that expedition ended last week. They were there for three months. People keep people came for a month at a time. There were a handful of people that were there the whole time, three months. But they added uh, 12 miles of cave to the cave system. I think it's now uh, about 55 miles long, something like that. I haven't kept up with all the work. Yeah, there's stuff always happening. But the most remarkable things, I think, are the, the underwater caves of the Yucatan, you know? Are, are you giving a presentation tonight? No. Tony, Tony uh, Akers is, and I'm here to listen to it. I hope he shows up. I don't see his name. I think he's there in person. Oh, that's right, of course. How long has your grotto been meeting at the same place? About 60 years. God, that's what I thought. I think I attended a meeting there about 50 years ago. Yeah. That's yeah, been forever. 
They used to go sneaking around the building. <laughs> this yeah. is the old, this is a uh, First World War Memorial. And uh, it's made out of stone from all the, all the allies countries that that got together and to knock out Germany back in the First World War. It's a pretty amazing place. They have a full museum down in the basement of, uh, with uh, you know helicopters and and um, all sorts of um, you know old stuff from every single war that ever affected Indiana. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. That's neat. And there's a, there's an auditorium and the. Uh, ceiling is cork so it has perfect acoustics it's really an amazing place Thanks. yeah that's just uh that's just to get on wi-fi yeah. Yes. You need to get on. Uh, you need the meeting number. The meeting number. Well, uh, let me move these guys. Oh, yeah. um, Here's a number. Still need this, do we, Charlie? What's that? Do you still need this? Nope. Uh, no. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. So you can just speak into your. If you go ahead and unmute yourself in there, you can just speak into that laptop. We also have this. Actually, actually, we'll probably just need to use that. 
Yeah. Use that and that'll that'll come through your other microphone. I lost my sound. Yeah, me too. Yeah, because it'll pick up the sound and everybody at home will hear it. So yeah. No. Yeah. no. Is his microphone, and I think everybody hears it pretty well from there. Okay. And maybe stay while you yeah. just speak with him. I'll find that and I'll let you know if you can't hear something. Okay, yeah, let me know if I need to switch up or yeah. Do you have this menu? Yeah. That yeah, that's for slide. <clears throat> Damn, I gotta click this thing, huh? This is this. It, okay. This one, right? What if I just uh, it and look it up, that's what you have a remote. There's no we have a remote, a remote now. I know, I know, I know. I just want to know how much freedom I have. I want to know how much freedom I had. The one round, I don't know if I had to vote. I can do that, so I have to be here. Got to be here? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Unless you want to have her. Oh, yeah. 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 Let me move this up here where I can. Yeah. Me in a little bit better position. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do. I just wanted to move it so I'm not with my back to the audience. Oh, you can. I'm going to put these in. Right? Okay, you guys, I think we're almost there. Can you uh, go to full screen on this too? Or does that screw everything up? No, I mean, in the program. No, no, just to the program. Do you have a full screen mode? Oh, it does. It has the note thing on the side, but that's what everybody else is seeing. They're seeing, we're seeing this, but this is what, people, but that's all right. It doesn't make any difference. Okay. If you can't, if you, oh, I was just trying to, to do get a pulse. Get, there it is. Well, well then that's good. Cool. But then how do you see it there? Well, they'll, they'll see it like that, which is fine. We want to see it like this. So I should. Come yeah, back go back to where you were. Uh, what are they doing? 
All right. That's a yeah. That's a good the screen. That's what everybody's gonna see. Oh, that's what everybody's gonna see there. Let's see. They can come to the meeting if they want the big show. Yeah. Oh, there we got it. I think I got it. All oh, right. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Ah. Hey, Charlie. Thanks for inviting me tonight. Uh, I have to admit, I've been super busy, so I'm kind of unprepared. I was going to show some of the history of uh, Free Echo Sailor and Free Echo Sailor Month. When I started looking at the show, you know, it was actually going to be 2011. And then uh, two years ago, I was invited to give a presentation at the Festival of the Lost Spoilers in uh, Wild Mexico. And um, the show was canceled. Uh, the event was canceled. The event was canceled. Anyhow, I was working on the event. It was about my age growing up in the seven months ago. And it started to be like this. And it was a banning. It was a general event. It was a great event. And it was a great event. And it was a great event. And it was a great event. This part is more than the previous year, which was just me. I had some of his son, he was really young, baby six So he, you know, started It was almost like one of them was saying, you know, I thought I'd have to turn him to all the guys from the Indian camp and help me. And my son, there's a serum off the tech. I mean, look at this thing. I'm thinking, wow, wow. You know, look, look at this. I mean, he's a little kid. We don't even really, you know, and you guys really can't help us with that a lot. So, anyhow, we're going to start with the serum off the tech. And Mark is also going to be the serum off the tech. It's a camera cloud for us with elevation 2,000 meters. Uh, yeah, we have passed over the forest. A lot of the same amounts of people involved in the state of mind to native members in certain areas. Uh, they speak the native Aztec language there. Um, the descendants are from ancient cultures. Uh, there's a lot of shamanism and psychedelic mushrooms are used for healing. And over the years, you know, I've had a lot of it. You know, you know, it's amazing how they actually did the mushrooms. Or the psychological medicine, you know, and, you know, for your mental state, you know, just you should look at things different, you know, it's something that even though I haven't done a lot of it in this era, you know, it has taught me to take negative things in my life and be able to look at it through a positive way. And uh, you know, one of the stories I'll share with you real quick with my compadre, I uh, was there, Marion, by the way, at her house, and Marion's grandmother actually died on her birthday. So we're and you know, she was down with me. I went to tell Lola, I was like, Mary just got news of her grandmother died, you know, and she's really sad. And the whole family were like, What? She's sad. What do you mean she's sad? That means you can't your place. Mary and I have all these weird um both and wow, okay, yeah, I'm my grandma, you know, it's just totally a different way of looking at things, you know, in a real positive light. So that was one quick example I can give. Um, there's a lot of coffee and sugar cane are the main industry there. And the area is famous for 
some of the deepest caves in the Western Hemisphere, or I believe, you know, the deepest cave in the Western Hemisphere. So when we first went to this area, uh, Joe, Tina, and I, uh, we, you know, we're looking at some maps, and of course, this kind of map really wasn't available back in the day, is 1994. Uh, these are a couple areas that were just located. This is named San Augustine. Everybody knew where that was. Uh, the Cueva Peña, Colorado. Um, there was Quijay Jontois and the Nacimiento Rio Lohan. Um, the resurgence spring up at the top there, um, that was kind of known. I mean, it was back from, I think it was some of the work uh, that Pemex did in the area and they knew there was a spring there. The lake that is there was actually a reservoir. So there was a time in the past where they knew there was a big massive spring to come out there. And the coffee town Carlota, we didn't really know where it was at that point. This is what we discovered on this trip. So when you start heading uh, from you know, east going west, the first thing you'll see before you get on the Sierra Mazateca is the Cerro Rabo. And this is uh, off the lake that, you know, it's not actually on the earlier map, but that resurgent spring is, you know, would be up in this direction from the plateau itself. Really beautiful. And there's a cave, uh, famous uh, cave resurgent spring, uh, Rio Olofan. That's uh, at the base of the Cerro Rabo. This is a picture. This is this is relatively high water coming out of there, and um, you can see how much water comes out of this thing. So, like this thing is so scary. Like when you walk up the ledge, I mean, you you know the, the bank there. I mean, it you don't want to get near it, right? Because it's like if you slipped and fell in that thing, it'd be over. So there's another picture of it. And that after it goes under the bridge uh, there, it kind of all crunches down to the smaller spring. This is what it looks like normal flow. Like, you know, a couple of pictures back, that picture is essentially that, but this is when it's regular. <laughs> really fun place to go swim. So once you pass the Rio Wall Pond, you get closer to Coffee Town Carlota. This is the, from the west looking east of the server alone. Looks like a big elephant's head. So this picture was taken from 94. This is Joe Alpha in his truck. And this is kind of what the road, this is actually the, the main part of the road going from Jalapa del Diaz to Watla. It got much worse than this. Pretty sure we were the first people to traverse the entire length of it. And this is on, uh, would be outside of Ayala, between Ayala and Calcuta Carlota. And when we got to Carlota, well, we didn't actually stay we didn't actually go to Carlo because it was off the road, but Joe, Tina and I were camping along the road and this guy comes walking down the road. He's like, you know, you probably shouldn't stay here. It's not very safe. And he was like, why don't you come and stay at my house? Where every house we went by was, you know, just like a little wooden hut, dirt floor. And we were like, you know, well, we got our tents. We don't really, you know, we're good here. And he was like, no, you should really come to my place. So Joe and Tina were like, look, we're cooking our meal, we're staying here. So I followed Waldo down to the ranch and uh, lo and behold, it was a, a coffee plantation. It'd been, you know, he was still working coffee out of there. But this thing's a historical landmark, actually. It was just kind of lost in time. And it's a picture. And over the years, there's been lots of cavers here. These are, you know, a lot of different people responsible for these photos. This was by Don Broussard, who passed away recently. I had the honor of having him down there, too. So this is an example of the, what the road looked like, you know, when we traveled through and we were actually, you know, we came down along the left side of the picture there. And it was, you know, about as tough of a four-wheel drive road, four-wheel drive road that you could go through, right, Greg? I mean, we almost drove off the mountain, you know, would have been sure death. So that was during the several uh, Okote years. And that's part of the show that I'm still working on. I had a bunch of slides reproduced digitally and I've still got those at home. And you know, once they canceled the festival de las cuevas at Wila, I just kind of lost steam on it. So this is kind of like, you know, putting the foundation of this thing together. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to show this thing for what it's worth. It's got a lot of meat there, but uh, it'll give me a, a couple practice runs to it. So, you know, we founded the Proyecto Sierra Mazateca and um, this was one of the guys that helped us, Antonio Jimenez. And this is for a picture maybe 12, 13, 14 years ago. Unfortunately, Antonio's in poor health and he's going blind. 
And uh, he did a lot of work with us. He didn't really cave a lot, but he did a lot of uh, local, you know, workforce as far as talking to the authorities and explaining what we're doing. And here we are going into uh, this cave's uh, Grutas de San Antonio, and it's in Los Chitlan. And Antonio, you know, I mean, you always got to take the machete in the cave, and don't forget your cell phone. Either. You want to take your cell phone because you're going to lose it, and he did. So that was kind of a bummer there, but it was a nice cave, highly decorated, really beautiful. Uh, Canadian cavers had mapped this thing back in like 1972, around that time period. And uh, we actually were able to locate a map for it. I think uh, Bill Mixon was able to find a map for it. And um, they did not push the cave to the end, however, and nor did we. Uh, we were just kind of on here to, you know, have something to do on a day trip. Uh, I know that there were some Mexican cavers, I believe, pushed this cave. Uh, Wicho Diaz uh, pushed this thing to the bottom. And just had some big rooms in it, really nice formations, kind of reminiscent of pictures you'd see of Carlsbad. Another kind of interesting thing about this cave is during the Mexican Revolution, um, they believed that the revolutionarios, they hid in this cave. And then when the time was right, they rode across the river and attacked a lot of the plantations on the, you know, the Sierra Mazateca side. And they pretty much, you know, burned the plantations you know, sacked it for everything it was worth, killed the people, and, you know, took over, ran all the foreigners out. And this is another cave that Antonio took us to. It's a Cueva de Santa Rosa. And it had like one, you know, sizable entrance, and then it's got a big skylight coming down into it. Just a long, steep slope going down into the cave. It was almost so steep, that you almost need to grow a couple spots. There's Marion, you know, map in the cave. And I'm kind of the one that plans all these crazy trips, right? Marion's the one that documents them all, really. So without her, I mean, I wouldn't have a lot of the stuff I have. She's a monster. She's working on cave maps, you know, literally every night at home. Right now, she's at the Joyce Kilmer Wilderness for a week on a solo backpacking trip. And then something that, you know, we learned early on uh, was to work with the kids. You know, there's a lot of, you know, myths and legends and, you know, long-term cultural beliefs within the Mazatec culture. And, uh, you know, they look at the caves in a whole different light than they really any of us can even imagine. You know, they think they're, you know, the, anything from bad spirits live in the cave. It's actually where they buried a lot of their dead back in, you know, years ago. Um, they hid in the caves. Um, and they do a lot, you know, when they do their mushrooms, I mean, the caves are really associated with a lot of things. They're really protective of it. And they're not, you know, they don't open up. But the kids are a little bit more interested in it. You know, they're a little bit more open to the idea of, well, what is a cave? You know, they don't really believe some of the ancient, you know, legends as much as the older people do, which in some ways is really unfortunate, you know, to see them lose that you know, part of it that's really, you know, their blood, you know, I mean, they have all the legends that teach kids in school. And Simon had the opportunity to go to school in one of these small villages. It was really interesting to, you know, how they taught them and, and, you know, they would teach them the legends of the area. And, you know, over the years, the state of Oaxaca has tried to bring teachers from the outside. And, you know, there's two theories on that. I mean, you know, they want to be educated teachers, but then they don't know the language. So slowly over time, the Mazatecs are losing their language. And it's kind of sad to see. So we're always explicando a los niños sobre las cuevas y biología. So we're always talking to the kids about the cave and the biology. And this is a Mike Frazier you see in the yellow helmet down by the entrance of this cave. He's from Colorado. And Mike and I have done a lot of work together over the years down there. Mike has done phenomenal work with the schools and you know educating the kids there. He's all heart. He loves to do it. And here he's got a whole class and we're surveying this cave. And here he is, and both Mike and I have done this over the years, and you know, it's through contributions from actually the Central Indiana Grotto, the NSS. I mean, there's a, a lot of you know sponsors we've had out there over the years, and we don't have time to you know say who they are. But here's a one day when Mike was handing out supplies to all these kids, and basically it's like notebook, pen, paper, coloring crowns, um, scissors, rulers. 
you know, uh, one year we gave away all that in like a little backpack, which we thought that was probably the best gift we gave. And there's kind of a picture. And Ernie Garza, unfortunately, has passed away, and uh, he was, spent a lot of time with us down there. So back to this map, you know, I got a couple other points on here. Uh, you know, we've got the real Lowell Pond, Quija Jontois, which is a cave that Swiss cavers push, and it's a deep cave as well. Um, the sea name of San Augustine, Cave de Peña Colorada. And we wanted to check out this area in Rio Santiago. There's a big spring, so we'd be up at the top there, some stream in Rio Santiago. There's a little bit closer up that road. There's a sinking stream to the left. And then we did all these pits uh, one trip down there. And uh, we met this gentleman there, uh, Fausto. He's the guy uh, with my son, Simon, in front of him. He's got the white hat on. Uh, his father to the left, he's passed away, actually. He died a couple years back. And it would be his, uh, his not, it's not his actual real mom, it's his stepmom. And then most of his kids, with the exception of his wife, would pay in the, the tan colored skirt. Wait. Oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, so actually, I tried to call him. Yeah, actually, Ron was telling me that Fausto tried to call him, you know, last night. Unfortunately, Fausto, maybe five or six years after this picture was taken, he was in a really uh, catastrophic car wreck in Oaxaca City one day after working on a housing project and actually busted the seatbelt, threw him out the front window. And this guy was probably one of the, probably the strongest man I knew in the Sierra Malteca. He was a bull. I mean, we've seen him carry like three pistols on his head strap and you're talking 200 plus pounds, you know, freaking head strap and carry it down the mountain. And, you know, he helped us a lot over the years. I mean, I can tell so many stories about Fausto. And, you know, there's always kickback. There's always, you know, a riff going on with the local communities. They got people that want you going up there. And we always have the proper permission. And then once we get permission, we kind of lay low. And Fausto, Fausto was saying, you know what? I think it's better if you guys are being clandestine, like clandestine. So upon his advice, we gave him a walkie-talkie. And we had a walkie-talkie up in the mountains. And whenever we needed supplies, we would radio down to them, you know, hey, we need to bring us up a case of beer and a bottle of mezcal and uh, some eggs, you know, something like that. <laughs> Remember one time he was like, you guys don't want any tortillas or anything? Yeah, Greg and Ron, if you ever want to jump in on any of this, you know, I mean, if you see a picture that reminds you of something that I'm missing because there were so many great times. Um, Fausto is a panadero. He was a bread maker. And this is an oven he actually made. And here we are. He's going to make us some bread. Yeah, it's pretty unbelievable how long it takes for that oven to heat up, even with that wood in there like that. So I can't remember. I was looking at this, Ron, and I can't remember. This is different than the night they had the cow udder hanging by your head, right? Wouldn't that you, like you had, remember they butchered a cow and like this cow over was hanging right next to your head? Wasn't that at Marcos? I think that was at Marcos. This is a bread thing. I, I need to find some of those pictures because this is right around the same time period. But yeah, that was a memorable trip. So this is another time we actually went there and we were making pizza with Fausto. And we had all the ingredients that you want on a Mexican pizza, cheese, oil, and jalapeno. It was pretty freaking spicy when we did it. And he never made pizza before. Robin Moore was trying to teach him how to make pizza. So here's some shots, you know, just a, this is a Soto Panadero. And this is actually when I first met Pasto. He caught me while he was in, I was in his pit. I was showed by a landowner in this pit. And he told me it was his. And of course, he left. I went down the pit. I'm coming out in the rain. And Fausto was standing there waiting on me. And uh, we went back and uh, did this the following year. You can see Simon in his one piece set harness. I can't remember how old he was then. He was pretty young. And this is at the bottom looking down another pit. It actually went down this pit. And then we went back later with Elliot Stahl and Rob Spangler and went down even another drop after that. I think it was about 100 meters deep vertically. Okay. 
Sorry, I'm trying to lower this down. Okay, gotcha. So yeah, the cave depth would have been 70 meters deep, so 220 feet, somewhere around there. So this is another pit that uh, I found out about in Rio Santiago. This is uh, Sotno Agua de Clima. And um, it was about, a, I think, a 90 meter drop. You can see the rig in there is kind of hairy. This is Pat Bud, I believe, traversing out to the main rig point out there. So this is, uh, yeah, 89.9 meters. So we always have a lot of fun out there. This was a one particular day, Disfruta la Naturaleza. And uh, Simon was getting a kick out of this. And what was really funny about it is that Simon was holding his fingers behind his back and Mike was guessing how many fingers he had up. But Rick, the dude behind Simon was telling him, you know, so Mike was guessing every time, and Simon was just floored, like, how does he know? You know, how does he know? You know, you know so he's looking at it like total, like, disbelief. <laughs> he was like putting that leaf on Mike's head, just kind of shutting him up. Yeah. And Mike was like, seven, you know, no way. <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. Oh. So anyhow, we were going to this cave and literally Fausto told me, he goes, I got a nice cave to take you to. I go, well, how far away is it? He goes, two minutes. I'm like, look, man, two minutes is across the road. There's no way this thing is two minutes away. So it was like two hours later, you know, he takes us in this thing. And it was pretty cool because it's like a hundred meters long, but it's all came. So you like rappel down into this thing and you're just like open roof. And you're going along the floor of it. And you had to rig, you know, certain areas of it. You see how Series got steep. This is the map of it. And that's one thing I, you know, got to give Marion tons of credit on. I mean, I think we've got like 98% of all the caves we've documented and explored there on paper and on the map. You know, and that's that's a huge thing for a project to have. So here's another one around Fausto's house, Sotno del Pedro, and it was 43 meter deep. Uh, I think this is a uh, Sotno de las Hormigas. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to get that bar off there. Is it even on here? You want to try? I don't want to. Oh. Yay. She did it. Okay. There's Andy Armstrong. Um, I can't remember the name. Yeah, Rupa Susius. This is. So there's a bunch of pits around Fausto's house, and then we were taken to this cave, Cueva de la Sorda, and um, the name La Sorda came from the snake that we found in the entrance. And at the time, all the locals were saying it was La Sorda, but after we took really good photos of it, it was identified as a, uh, it'll come to me. But there's like only one in known, known in captivity in the whole United States. It was a super rare snake. Um, so we got really good pictures of them and have any of my show right now, but we did get all that verified. And I'll remember what the name is for the night's done. This is a picture of Mike looking down one of the pits and uh, the La Sorda. It was a pretty complex cave, you know, and there was a bunch of pictures that we had that, you know, aren't in my show that I need to add to this show. There's some vertical work, of course as in all the caves there. I think this is the top of the last drop. Yeah. 
yeah, at the bottom of this shop, it goes into a really tight hallway and Simon pushed it all the way to the end on this particular trip. So, you know, it's kind of scary when you got your kids somewhere and they can't, you can't get to them and you're in the middle of nowhere in a cave in Mexico. <laughs> and all I'm doing is saying, be careful, be careful. Don't do anything stupid. And I think when he's back there, it's kind of stupid because I can't get to him. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Where's it go? What's it do? Come back out. No, go back in. Is he faster up the road than you are? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he held the world record for like 12, 13, 14, 15. And he was, yeah, he's fast. I think he clung at NSS two years ago. It was like a minute 23 or something, 30 meters, 100 feet. Hey, Tony. Yeah. Go back one slide. No, wait. Okay, maybe this is the next one. Oh, yeah, it's the next one. Yep. Yeah. Here, you know, picture of Ron sketching. There's Adam Share. Adam just called like two minutes ago. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't know how to answer it, but it's kind of ironic. I don't talk to him that often. So this thing's on some kind of automatic. Forwarding Aida. How do I get out of that? It's going forward by itself. Yeah, I think so. Hang on, maybe not. It was. Looks good now. Don't need it. Yeah. Thanks. So, picture of Ron in this sketch. Yeah, it's going by itself. There's Rollin Moore and Lasorda. Try to right click. So yeah, we all remember our first all night tow trip. So that was that was the other part. The other thing Fausto would do. He was like, I'm gonna take you to this cave, but we can't go in the daytime. We gotta go at night. So you know, we get all ready and it's like, you know, you're going to the cave, you know, 10 at night and getting out at six in the morning. And even though, you know, Simon, he was pretty exhausted. I think you just have to. You see, this one is false too. So maybe uh, there's going to be double click it. Try it. I'm not really sure that you can try it. Now it's stopped. It's stopped. No next. No. No next. No next. Yeah, a lot of that black man's but uh, back Sorry, auto. That wasn't it. <laughs> we'll go now. That shouldn't control the there it goes. computer. It should okay. not. Okay. Uh, cuidemos el agua, la vegetación y los animales por México siempre verde. We're just saying protect the water, vegetation, the animals for being Mexico. And then uh, this is another cave we did. This is farther down the mountain uh, on the other side of Jalapa, is Cueva, La Sorpresa Seccion Mariano. And it was a, just a big horizontal cave. It was really beautiful, had lots of bats, uh, lots of, at one time, lots of burial sites in it, but it had been sacked by the locals. It was a really pretty cave. Warm too. There's all kinds of stuff going on in here, like stuff like histoplasmosis, I'm sure. <laughs> like all those formations, that's all bat guano. And there was a bloody bat man, bat bat. Wow. Yeah. Some nice red colors on the cable. Yeah, look at all the bats flying around. <laughs> oh, spider with all Jones, it's cool. There's even a snake in the cave. There's a low celebration cave. Yeah, I think you're right for sure. If you want. So this is the map. Of the La Sorpresa. And after we got this thing explored, map, took us a couple of years to do that because you know we divide that up with other things that we're doing in the area. Uh, we were Told we couldn't go back there anymore, but fortunately we'd already had the map done. So then uh, this is Waldo Garcia. He's the owner of the Capital Carlota. 
And uh, this is his bar in Watla. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago. This, uh, here, this backwards. So this is uh, Paul with Waldo. He gave him this jacket and Waldo loved that thing. And now his son, Mickey has it. It's still advanced on its own. Deal with that thing. Okay, that's what's doing it, Tony. Okay, so then we went to a place called uh, Rainbow Ranch, and this is back over in the Rio Santiago area. <laughs> Heading there. This is uh, Waldo's brother, Simeon, and uh, he's still alive and he lives on the ranch, Cocktail Carlota, and he hiked up there with me one day. That's our hike in. This is the owners of the house we stayed at. So Mario on the left, he used to live in these houses and he uh, cut timber up there. And that's his wife, Paulina. And once they got electric to Rio Santiago, pretty much everybody moved down the mountains, went downtown. So they have, he has a couple of abandoned houses up there that you know, we were able to stay in. We paid him rent and uh, that worked out quite well. This is our hike in, we have burrows. And uh, you see the guy in the middle, Braulio, he's the local drunk, but something about Braulio is he was a hard worker. He was always working. Even if he was plastered, he was working. And uh, he wanted to go up there with us and we got him to carry this rope. It was more like, look, man, if you're gonna go up there with us, you're gonna work, you're gonna carry something. So we just kind of threw the rope on him. He didn't like it, he was not liking it, but he never turned around and left the rope. So he just wanted to see where we were camping. So Ron always brings his guitar on the expeditions, which works out well because he entertains us at night with music. Simon driving the burrows. I learned after a while that the burrow wouldn't respond to anybody else yelling at it other than the owner. And you know, like if he heard the owner, like, like Mark was yelling. Not only do you think Marco was the owner, I think it was a friend of his, but he knew Marco's voice, the burrow would take off running. So I noticed if I could, you know, do Marco's voice, the burrow would run. Like I would try to imitate Marco's and think that I'd get all scared to take off. <laughs> we had a burrow wreck up there too, I think that trip. Didn't one of the burrows fall and we had to take a bunch of gear off of it and stand it back up. And... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So yeah, this is actually under this uh, rift area outside of the wooden house we stayed in. Some people camped, some people had their tents up, some people stayed inside. And uh, this is kind of a funny story because I remember asking, talking to Mario about what was it like to live up there? And he was like, sometimes it's so cold, you're just sitting up there in a trash bag, staying warm. And you know, lo and behold, this is what happened to us too. We were up there in trash bags, trying to stay warm. Yeah, he's showing off his wooden spoon that he made. So he carved that spoon out of some stick he found up there. So. Yeah. <laughs> it's ours. Not that table's like two tall or something. Yeah. Yeah, it's perfect for him. So this is Ron with the Ron Aritas. So we had these citrus trees like there were old citrus trees on the, the homestead there and we'd go pick the limes off of that. And we had alcohol up there, of course. This is the year we had the radio with Fausto so we could order anything we want. He would bring it up at midnight. He'd like bring burrows up there at nighttime so nobody knew that we were up there. Here's Andy Armstrong, centipede. This is where a singing spring uh, in that area. I pushed that thing. I mean, it went through some really gnarly breakdown and I could hear the water, water trickling down farther below me, but wasn't even able, able to follow it. This area could, you know, it's got some caves to be found there still. Here are a typical survey scene. So I believe this is, yeah, this is a cave that Mario took us to. It was called a, uh, Sotno Espiritu de McLean. And that name came from Tim McLean. He was actually trying to come on this particular expedition. 
And that was the year he passed away in Big Weekend. So he wasn't able to do it. We knew that Tim had died. And then we just, you know, we found this thing. It was just such a beautiful place out in the middle of the jungle. You know, nobody had ever been there. Like everything we're doing out here you know, is all virgin exploration. Like it's original exploration. You know, maybe the locals have seen it. A lot of locals have taken to us. You know, there are things we found on our own. So it was pretty cool to be taken to this big giant pit that had several entrances to it. And this is actually another pit. I think it turned out to be around 30 meters deep. And that was at the floor of the main giant entrance shop, so no to claim. And we pushed that to the bottom, it was just a dead pit. You kind of see how big it is. And the guys up there on the rock, kind of at the center of the picture, they could go behind them and go into another pit complex back in there. Uh, this is Paul Moselle, I think, at the top of the uh, uh, 50 peso, Cinquenta peso pit, where he dropped a 50 peso bill down the pit, and then he was able to find it later. And this is the hike down from that particular trip, taking all the gear out. And there's another time when we handed out. I think this was the one we bought a projector for the school there. And the school had actually become abandoned. And this guy right here, Lorenzo, he went in on his own dime with his wife and they opened the school back up and started teaching the kids there. And, you know, he's still there today. Yeah, we bought him a check. The, actually, the CIG donated the money for this projector. And we talked to the teacher and found out, you know, what do you guys need here? What, you know, what's the most important thing? And he wanted a projector so he could, you know, instruct bigger groups of kids at once. And this is the local uh, taco stand um, that we always eat at, really good tacos. And then this next one looks like Proyecto Sierra Mustech 2014. We're back in Rio Santiago. That was the year we went up with Marcos. There's Marcos right there with Ron's guitar, Burrow loaded down. Yep, going up again. There's some of the citrus trees. And uh, Mario would come up there and he had this big cut on his hand. It was really nasty and infected. And Andy treated him first aid, cleaned it up. Um, Check out that saw so you can see how much they resharpened that thing over the years. Originally, it was, you know, the high end there. And these are some of the posts they cut. Look how straight and smooth those things are. They cut them and they shave all the bark off of it. This is a Sotno Diente Engancha. This is a pretty cool pit. Kind of come went down to this ledge, see where Simon and I are sitting on the ledge. We drove, we put a bolt in there too. We clipped in the bolts so we didn't fall off. This thing's going crazy on its own again. And then uh, this is another pit, uh, Ronald Moore, top of Sotno Respaloso, I mean, slippery pit. Andy, Mario, and myself. That was back to McLean. It's got a picture of McLean. So all these pits were in one area. We were doing pits for several days there. This is a spring cave. It was a little bit lower down the mountain. Sotno de Archimedes. Uh, that was a pit that we didn't get to the bottom. We didn't get to the bottom. We ran out of rope. It was, a, it was a pretty scary pit, actually. It was nice. There's Ron at the top of it. Going down one of the drops in it. 
And that's great about the Montec people is, you know, they always treat you to food, coffee, They're really hospitable, really giving. So this is 2015 expedition. So here's some of the conditions you can be found in up there. Look this, like you know, wide out. Essentially, you got typically the passenger is hanging his head out the window, screaming left, left, left. And you know, the more he screams left, obviously you know that you're going off the right hand side of the road. But the whole car goes into panic. Everybody starts screaming. And I mean, it's literally the only way you can travel up there when it's foggy. Here's where we went up 12, 12 days up there, back to the house. We stayed at these houses two years. One year there was two houses, and the next year there was only one house. It took one part of the inside of it. Like I said, not everybody stayed inside. That was kind of our kitchen. It's not sure. And sketching. There's a lot of javeline, like the little pigs that run through the mountains. So a lot of times we'll find these skeletons in the caves. Uh, this is Shakedown Canyon. It's Ray and Hazlet. There's Mike and Donna. Is it? They left a little bit early that year. And then we did this thing, Cornhole, which uh, Mario took us to. It was 85 meter deep. It's pretty deep. Couple drops in there. You can see the redirect webbing coming off the wall. Make it a clean drop. Here we are. So the locals know where these entrances are, but they don't know what's in them. Yeah, a lot of times the locals, you know, a lot of times we find them on our own. But you know, it's kind of if you know a local that knows where caves are, kind of gets you, gets the ball rolling. Like, okay, you kind of see what's going on, you kind of know where to look. But you know, some of this terrain is like super rugged, and you want somebody to be able that knows the area. And Mario, because he lived up there, and you know, cut timber all over the mountains. So there's the hunters usually know the mountains well. You know, the guys that cut timber usually know the mountains well. And aside from that, those group of people, I mean, nobody really goes up there. You know, so it's kind of on your own. And it's hard bushwhacking. This is a pit we found. Uh, actually, Mario took us to this one called Cinco de Mayo. Mm -hmm. And let's see somebody hanging on rope there. These are Ron's pictures. Some big, somebody up the lip up there at a replay, I think. There's like one little drop this at the end of it. And this is another pit. It's uh, Soto 45. And it was just kind of off a trail and had a big log jam on top of it. That's about all it was. Like a 130-foot deep. And here we are back in the kitchen. Must have been cold that night. So then we moved to uh, 2016, took us to Cerro Caballero. And these are some shots where you're gonna see a little bit more of all that goes into it as far as when we go up the mountain, um, this, this expedition and the next one. There's the trail we were going up. These trails were just ancient Maztec trails. Um, we had some water haulers, and this is where they got the water from, put them in jugs. These were 20 liter jugs, and they'd haul them with the head straps up to us. We collected a lot of our own water, rainwater, uh, when it would rain, but it didn't always rain, so we got to figure something out. That's the, actually the Pico El Caballero right there. And yeah, there's a crew, there's one of our couple guys in our group, Tom. Uh, uh, Mike Frazier and Thomas Hawkins, and I think there's one other person that went all the way to the top. So this was what we deemed Hell's Kitchen. And it was like the worst kitchen setup ever. In fact, you could go out hiking the entire day in your cage, 
and come back at one in the morning and literally turn to everybody and go, we're back at base camp, be careful, don't fall. I mean, it was like the most dangerous part of the freaking trip because the rocks became really slippery and muddy. And, it was, and yeah, and there's like just on the other side, literally at the edge of the plastic, there's like a 230 foot pit right there that we camped right on the edge of. No sleepwalkers? Yeah, no sleepwalkers. And that thing was cold some mornings. Remember how the wind came out of that thing? And just like the trees, the leaves and stuff would be blowing like crazy. Here's always the nightly festivities. Yeah, there's Okolo. Zaida. So yeah, this is a chop fest. This was to establish a base camp for the next year coming up. This is all cilantro. It's mountain cilantro. And uh, it's not actually even in the cilantro family, but it tastes like cilantro and it's really good. So we would pick it and take it to our uh, camp and put it in our food. This is on top of that peak, so we'll probably go, I was telling you about earlier. Somewhere, oh, there it is. There's Orizaba off in the distance. You kind of see it in the middle, right in the middle to the left of the picture. It's a 18, like 18,000 foot high mountain, I think. Somewhere around there. Oh. Yeah. No, there's snow. You can see it right there. See the snow on it. It's right, right in the middle to the left. Yeah. So this is just kind of like what it looks like chopping through the jungle. You know, there's a better picture chopping through the jungle. Sometimes it's just like so thick and you're just trying to get to some sinkhole you've located on a topographic map. This is the pit right next to camp. Uh, Sotno de Serpiente uh, in Maztec, I think it's Nita Ya. It's at the bottom. We did catch it. We did set up a water catch system at the bottom. We really never used the water out of it, but we went back and cleaned it all up and we'd collect a lot of water. Uh, this is a head wall that we located in the jungle and one end of it, we went down a pit. Um, we called it uh, Mi Esperanza. Thomas Hawkins found it. See some of the fold in the limestone. Mm -hmm. These huge agave plants out in the middle of the jungle. And this is Mi Esperanza. It was uh, 67 meters, a couple hundred feet. Of course, we use all European rigging techniques. I mean, we really have to. So I eat at the bottom. Yeah, it's, it gets cold. The waiting is the hardest part. <laughs> Just wait and wait and wait. Here's back at base camp, Bill's Kitchen. Everybody is a free for all in the morning. Everybody just pitches in and starts cooking or cleaning. There's Jorge, he's a great guy. Really helps out a lot. And here we are back at the ranch after the trip, having some beers. There's Ernie. And he was always a big positive influence on everything going on down there. So this is a cave we uh, went to, Boca Fea. Actually, one of our friends in the area knew about Boca Fea. It was on his uncle's property who didn't want us in the cave. But he was going to take us to the cave and show where it was. He was going to guard the entrance in case his uncle came by. So we went down and just, it was, you know, quite a nice cave. A lot of vertical, super dangerous. Everything was loose. And it was, Pretty scary. And then here we are passing out more school supplies. And again, those were all contributions uh, from the CIG all these years right here. So here we did, uh, we surveyed 13 total caves. So here's kind of cool. The horizontal survey was 357 meters. The vertical survey is 607 meters. 
you're talking, you know, like 1,400 feet or no, 607 years. So anyhow, this is the end of my show. I mean, I can keep going. Just tell me when to stop. <laughs> so this is Simon. This is uh, one of his earliest pits. And actually, Bill Steele. I think Bill's out there tonight somewhere. I think he's here. But uh, he was actually clipped had Simon clip below him on this little drop. It wasn't much of a drop. He actually went down in this cave and he went through a car that crashed in the sinkhole. And that's how you got into the cave. Crawled into, like through the car window and out the trunk or something like that. And you're in the cave. And uh, yeah, here's one of the early pictures of, well, it's probably Simon's first pit. In 2009, so he would have been like, Seven, seven or eight. Um, see, I have my cow's tail clipped to him and two ropes. So I'm tethered to him the whole way. So here's back to our home page. This is where I live in Oaxaca. Plantation. Always lots of kids around, especially when Simon was little. He had like 15, 20 kids there every day playing soccer. And, getting in fights and picking on your sisters and trying to steal shit and you name it, they were doing it. And then uh, this is our neighbor, Juana, that's her stove. So, you know, if your wife's ever complaining about cooking, just show them this picture and tell them you can get them a stove like that. And actually Juana had a stove, but she got rid of it because she likes to pick up her firewood better. She's like, I don't know why, but I'd rather go collect my own firewood. And uh, yeah, these guys became a really good friends of mine. And then I don't want to say they take care of me when I'm there, not that I need it, but they cook me food, bring it to my house, and you know, they watch watch my property. I have a piece of property down there, and they're the ones that watch over it when I'm not there. And it's been pretty cool to see the impact that we've made on their lives because they literally had nothing. One will tell you they used to live like dogs wherever they could stay in this corner or that corner. And then they finally got a little piece of land and they put up a little tin house on it. And, you know, it was the only thing they had and, you know, they worked their asses off. I mean, it's pretty incredible how hard they work. And then, you know, they really, their land, little piece of land butted up against my piece of land. So I was like, look, when I'm not here, you know, you guys use my land, you know? And so now they grow all the food there. And, it's really made a big difference in their life. They're native Mazatecs, which for me is, it's really been a, quite an honor in my life to be this close of friends with native Mazatecs and they can really share their beliefs with you. And, uh, you know, I remember one time Aida was there with me and I was telling Juana how Aida sometimes woke up at night. You know, she was restless. She'd wake up in the middle of the night and Juana looks at me with this big look of concern and she was like, well, take lime, which is just like dust, like essentially concrete <laughs> dust, and throw it in her face. And if her eyes get pasted shut, she's not a witch. But if she opens them up and she can see, she's a witch. <laughs> and well, I was like, Wanda? <laughs> but yeah, they look out for me. So these are some of the hazards in the Sierra. Like you, know, you can drive along and all of a sudden from the night before from a rain, there's these big boulders that fall down and just road. This is uh, some of the work we did in Cerro Caballero again. It's like this community is really, really poor and the kids don't get anything for Christmas. So I believe Rowland Moore and I, you know, out of our own money, we threw a big festival for them, bought a bunch of little toys and snacks and went there and we had a great time. And then- uh, You wouldn't think they'd run us out of gunpowder. Yeah, I know, who knew, you know, we did everything we could for them. And, you know, I guess we didn't spread the love far and deep enough. So then this is the year we went up to, this is a uh, Cerro Leaky Amber. So yeah, as Ron said, you wouldn't think they'd come after you with guns, but sometimes we will. So this guy on the right's Ben Feinberg. He's actually written a book about Sierra Mazateca. Um, it's uh, the Devil's Book of Culture, mushrooms, caves, and something else in Southern Oaxaca. 
but he's an anthropology professor at uh, Warren Wilson University in North Carolina. And he hung out with us on a number of our expeditions. And here we are uh, hiking in the set of our base camp. It's, this guy in the middle, his name is Eleuterio. It's a mouthful. Super nice guy. He used to be the representative of the community. And by the time we got to him, he'd lost his representative status. He didn't really have any authority to speak of. But he showed me that he had the, they use these seals, like an ink stamp, where they authorize stuff. And he was like, well, I'm not really the guy in charge anymore, but I still have the ink stamp. And he goes, and as a matter of fact, this doesn't have a date on it. So I guess it never expires. So he like approved everything we did. And it didn't really get us into trouble with him. In fact, they, they did quite well and helped us and when we had to run. <laughs> so this is back at the plantation. This is getting ready for a trip. You know, so everybody's got their gear laid out. I think that's Ron's area, is it Ron? Yeah, that's Ron's going on. It's actually pretty organized. So Juana and Antonio, her husband, my neighbors, I was telling you about earlier, they always cook for us. They'll kill a couple chickens or whatever, and they cook this big meal for us the night before we leave on our expedition. Um, and here we are at the ranch. We're getting everything ready. This is another building on the ranch, getting all of our stuff together. So you kind of see what it takes to put together an expedition like this, right? And we're not going through an outfit or anything. We're setting all this stuff up on the It's a mountain of work, believe me. I mean, look at all those bags. Those all got to go up the mountain, you know? So you got our last several years of our expeditions, you know, we'd have 20 to 25 local guys that would carry our stuff up for us. We paid them well, you know, we paid them more than they would make anything else they'd be doing. A lot of times they would not even work. And they were always invited to go with us. And a lot of times they did. And uh, usually it dwindled down to like two or, uh, two or three. Because, you know, once they were up there a couple nights, they were like, you know, what's going on here? I don't, just, I don't want to do this. And then there was always a couple guys that would really be into going on the whole trip with us. So this is when we actually went up to a base camp that Aida, myself, and Ben Feinberg, Ellie Uterio, and uh, another guy went up and said, so here we are hiking up. Yeah, I think you're right. We like puking all the way up. Yeah, here we are. Paying guys, paying for work. A bunch of them hanging out. You kind of see that's the beginning of the base camp. This is what we got. This is what Aida, Ben, and I set up with Ellie Terry. We just went up there one day with minimal gear, you know, whatever we could carry, really. We set up a tarp, and by the time we got up there, we had water collected. It was kind of a rain catch system. Yep, yeah, we just catch water and then we'll filter it with some kind of net to get all the jungle debris out. And, you know, it was bad years ago, Greg could attest to this, you know, like the old pure water filters from the 90s, they would plug up within like a couple gallons, just from all the organic microscopic debris in the water. And it was, it was rough, you know, to try to figure out how to filter water. A lot of times you just end up blowing water. And it was kind of cool, the more time that we spent in the jungle, we started actually learning what wood we could burn, even in like super wet conditions and it would burn and we'd, pretty much had a fire going 24 7 you know, cooking food on it and coffee and groups would come in one o'clock in the morning sometimes and we'd all be ready for them so all these guys and more they came back to help us out later on the trip this is the little net we used to get all the debris out of the water Okay, yeah, so check out this video. I don't know, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Drain.
So this is actually this <laughs> this pit that we found. We found this thing and we wanted to go to it, of course, but it was kind of a long ways out. So we were like, you know what? You know, some people want to stay in camp and rest. And I think it, maybe we all rested in camp one day, but then two days after that, Ellie and Terry was like, I know where this pit is and I got to figure out how to get to it, but I want to take it to it. So it was this pit of uh, Sotno de Los Martinez, which is his last name. Um, it was a 117 meter pit. Um, I think, it, I can't remember. Do you remember, Ron, if that was from the high side? Did we shoot that to be that deep or is that the low side? Uh, this, survey yeah, I think it was survey depth, yeah. So anyhow, this thing was enormous. And it was in the middle of the jungle through all these cars. I mean, it was like a maze to get to it. You know, it was pretty incredible that he could even find it. And he says he knows where another one is, but he can't figure out how to get there. So imagine you're walking in a train and you know something's there, but you don't know how to get to it. I mean, that kind of describes, it's not because you can't find it, you know where it is, it's just how do I get there? How do I get around all these cars to get you to this thing so we can rig and go down it? Let me see the bottom, how big the bottom of this thing is. Yeah, there was like, we were, yeah, wading through guano, like back when, like knee deep, it was like dust. It was like going through, it was dry. So it's just a pit? Yeah, just a pit. So I think this may have been, before we can get back and go to the other pit that, uh, yeah. So anyhow, uh, we were talking about being run out earlier. So we found the pit, the video where we took the rock down it. Then we went to Soto de los Martinez and we were so excited about going back. And when we got back from Martinez, there was a group of guys that were loggers and they found out we were up there. And they come into camp while half the camp was gone. They're threatening to take the other half of camp back to their village and you know just kind of kidnap them and run off. Unfortunately, there was a guy, a local guy that talked sense to them. They didn't end up doing that. But... Yeah, Simon was involved in that. Adam was involved in that. And you know, I wasn't there during the time. You know, all I got, I got back at 10 o'clock that night, and Marion was like, You got to go back down to Placio at like 10 in the morning, you know, so I had to hike off the mountain in the morning, and like get up early at dark and hike down there. And there was like 12 guys there. I mean, these guys came in with like, you know, weapons. Like, you know, I wasn't there, but nine millimeter, you know, some of them had some automatic guns and shotguns. And we're basically, you guys are out of here. You know, we don't want you here. So, you know, I went down to Palacio the next day and met with them and Marion was with me. And, you know, it was kind of heated. You know, they were like, you know, no, no, in certain terms, you guys are going to stay up there. You're leaving. And the, the, I was actually the vice president was like, we're recommending that you suspend your expedition. Um, you're lucky they, they let you go and they agreed to meet with you here because there's no telling what these guys may have done. So, you know, we thought, yeah, it's best. I mean, we never really forced ourselves from anything and we had permission to go here. But, you know, we just went to the wrong area and they didn't want us there, so we left. I think it's worth mentioning that we ran stop and the Yeah, uh, that was, yeah, definitely. So that was the other point is that we were up there and we witnessed that they were logging, you know, nature reserve. They're not supposed to be up there logging that shit. So they were like, you know, we got to get these guys out of here before they tell somebody. But they're also breaking yeah, 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 for sure. Okay, cool. All right. Well, I mean, I got you know most of my shit in, and then this is one of the year we went back to San Juan, Quetzal's farm, and we did some pits up there. Um, and we school supplies. 
CIG, bunch of guys. This is a Guatemala milk steak that was in the house where I live. And it's, you know, it's not uncommon to get all kinds of snakes in your house there. Mostly coral snakes were really fine. This is not a coral snake, by the way. Uh, it's a Guatemala milk snake. It's non-poisonous. Yeah, and then uh, this is the year I think Joe passed away. I'm going to dedicate this presentation to him. So anyhow, nice. anybody got any questions? Ron's going to take this thing apart. Yeah, I hope y'all enjoyed the show. Yeah, there, there's more and more drones down there now. I mean, you know, we're always kind of careful taking technology down to an area like that because people are so poor and they're going to think all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we've been the victim of fake news, you know, really. I mean, we had an article written about uh, our project and Bill Steele's project and you would not believe the stuff that they were saying. Like, you know, we were there. What was it, Aida, about the thermonuclear weapons? And we're documenting all the caves so we know where they're hiding and we come after them. I mean, it's low, crazy stuff, you know. This article was written in a, you know, pretty famous, you know, online website. You know. Yeah, well, that was the end of this trip where we were accused of stealing kids and you know, so yeah, a lot of times you get yourself into pretty pretty precarious situations. It's all, you know, it's all a kind of like a you know calculated risk, you know, really. I mean, you just gotta make that judgment call and so, so was, it that, was it always that way from the very beginning or it it's gotten worse. Yeah. I mean, from the very beginning it wasn't that bad. I mean, you go in there and we always got permission from Locke and government. So we just go in there for, with a letter from the government. And they were like, well, you got a letter from the government going in you know but then over the years they learned to say no you know and then you know really what's made it bad now is narcos have moved in the area uh, the narco traffickers you know and, yeah just illegal activities you know and they're pretty brazen you know you know it's not uncommon to, well i've never i've never had it actually happen on the road well yeah i have it actually happen on the road but people will like set up road jams or roadblocks and rob you. You know, and they do it just outside of where I live. You know, they put a big log in the road, and wait for somebody to come and pull the gun on you and take your money and move the log and let you go. Yeah, that's probably up there. But it's, it used to never be that way. It was actually one of the most beautiful, peaceful places I've ever been in my life, you know, back in the 90s and, you know, late 90s or 2000s. But then over the years, I mean, a lot of People would go to Mexico City to work. A lot of the younger generation would come back and learn how to steal and learn bad things. They could bring it back with them. And then, you know, probably the biggest impact has been cell phones. You know, and they don't really have any. A lot of them don't really understand what it's like to be off the mountain, so they watch stupid stuff on TV and think that the way people act in the soap opera on TV is the way you're supposed to react to everything. You know, so they just get really dramatic and. You know, it's, but, you know, their defense, I mean, the indigenous culture that went out in the middle of nowhere for many years just for indigenous beliefs. And, you know, that's something I've always tried to, you know, be sympathetic to them and, you know, try to educate them those things. And, you know, I actually was at the old field one time. And I was always warned about uh, biogenetic corn and stuff because if they plant it there, the native corn would be knocked out and be able to grow and just kind of take it over. And, you know, every corn they plant when they harvest it, they save seed from that corn they plant the next year. It comes out and grows. You know, so they actually, and I told them, I was like, if somebody they're going to come here trying to sell the corn and, you know, beware, don't buy it. And sure enough, they came there and they had these giant ears of corn and they weren't trying to sell it. They were actually giving seed away. You know, you plant this seed, you grow this corn. You know, and everybody was freaking out about it. I was like, oh, that's like three times as big as the corn I grew. You know, I want some of this corn. You know, and fortunately, I talked to Sidney Rooney and he warned me. He was like, look, well, this Tony was telling me about this. If this is going to happen, it's happened. And of course, they may be suspicious. They ended up not taking any of the corn. So it's, you know, it's it's a big giant battle. And sometimes you, you know, you know sometimes you do something good and win. And a lot of times that's only for a limited amount of time because, you know, they're not going to quit. They're not going to quit trying to bring that stuff in the Sierra. They're just going to keep, keep pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. And, 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 
Yeah. 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 No, like Penny made the president of Mexico, like he had a big uh, what do you call it? A project one year and every every family in the Sierra Mosque got a big screen TV. You know, so they would sit there and watch the news. I mean, it was crazy. And you see like the younger generation. The younger generation can't work as hard as the older generation. It's pretty wild. And they recognize it too. They're like, look, they're going to be very low. Yeah. And you see it. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that big pit still up there. Yeah, two of them. Uh, it's in a good area. Yeah. We're talking about Caballero River, the, the rock we threw in. Oh, yeah. Pit. It was a beautiful couple yeah. nights of dreaming about that movie. Oh, man. <laughs> you know, imagine this point when you're there and you know we're going tomorrow to see this thing. And you got nine armed men coming to your camp. You know, it's like, no, you're not. You know, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. It is. Uh, yeah, it's um, you know, breath was totally which is like a 275 meter drop. Uh, there was an explosion. Well, yeah. 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 No, we weren't. We were the first ones bottom. So we didn't know it was there. Uh, and I don't think we didn't know it was there. We knew it was around there. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And a lot of rigging out you know, in that area. It's, it's pretty freaking dangerous. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at least, I mean, like, at least when we found breath was total, you know, the way we found it is we're walking through the jungle, and all of a sudden it's like, there's a road here. There's a dirt road going down this hill. What is this? And it's actually we're whole freaking side of the mountain. It's slid off and you know, so there's all these new stuff, you know, they fall or something. Yeah. And probably one of the deepest cave systems in the world. Yeah. 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 That makes some days in the Oh, is the meeting still on? Apparently, a lot of spaces are open. Hey, guys. Yeah. And, uh, I was just saying that the grotto trips are doing like preparation trips. I can still wait for the video to go here. So I'm like, on the way. I'm not the So we do have a spiritual space.
Hey, y'all. That's our show for the day. Hope you enjoyed it. I see some nice notes, some thanks, and, and uh, interest in the presentation. And I'll pass that on to Tony. Thanks a lot for showing up. We're all heading to the Slippery Noodle. We'll talk to you guys later. Bye-bye.